I didn't know a few weeks back when I filled in once for Marty that I would be filling in one more time, but so it is, and uh, welcome the younger set might have been over the way in here tonight and want them to be ready to participate just the same as any of the rest of you. I want to announce right at the first, especially for those who have been in the class over the weeks that Marty has been studying the gospel according to John. If you have any question about some chapter, some verse, some part of the gospel of John that you're wondering about, so turn your brain on fast mode to review those 21 chapters and try to recall if there is any question you want to ask about some part of John. I'm going to just open up this wrap-up session of the book to questions. However, you have just received an outline and if you have the general response of often adult classes and just wait for a lecture lesson and not ask any questions, well, if that's what you do, we'll get to this outline and we will deal with it. But I do want you to have the opportunity to ask questions. If you, anyone else need an outline while he's up here? Here comes Jacob. There they are. And uh, I'll at least, even if we had question and answer period, I'll try to touch on some of those things right at the end so you know what you have in your hands. I mentioned when I was teaching four or five weeks ago, one Wednesday evening, that I had three different outlines, one for the session we was going to have that night, one that would relate to about 13 weeks of study like Marty has been doing on the book of John for 13 weeks now. And then the other one, like I taught at sunset, and that went for three times a week, six hours a week for 10 weeks. That'd be 60 hours, and it's a little fatter. And uh, so you're getting the one in the middle here now that I mentioned even at that session. I just didn't hand it out to you at that time. But I have rambled for a minute or two to give you time to organize your question. If you have any question from, Gen, uh, from John 1.1 1, 1 to the end of the 21st chapter, if any of you have a, yes, Billy? All right, in the outline that I gave you, there is a section on the witnesses that testified concerning Jesus, and one of those witnesses happened to be John. In fact, that's mentioned first. That's over on about the fourth or fifth page, I think. No, six, seven. <laughs> Toward the end, right at the end. Uh, there are the witnesses. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is because, number one, you have what your question is, when did he really come to understand that Jesus was the Son of God? Well, that's stated in John 1, 26 down there. You can relate on that. 29. Yeah. 
there is there are two factors involved. One would be kinship fleshly, like any one of us might come to know. Got word yesterday a baby was born, and uh, we know the name and the number of inches, and where is a boy or a girl, and we get information like that. We share with each other. There's human inside. But John had something a whole lot more than that because John 1, 29 points out quite clearly that he saw the dove descending. And uh, that could have been at the baptism because we know from Matthew 3, about verses 17, 18, 19, that at the time Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and the Spirit of God came upon him like a dove descending. And uh, the testimony then after that, John said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, Billy, I don't know the hour or the occasion, but I'm saying that at least by John 1, 29, when he saw the dove descending, that was a divine sign, and now he was not speaking on the basis of a little card he received through the mail about the birth of a baby somewhere that weighed so much and so many inches. That information came out of heaven. And it was then thereafter that he did know that Jesus was the Son of God. Donnie? I don't mind saying I don't know when I don't know. And so how much interaction they had had personally, uh, we don't have all the record. In fact, I was noting today in some of my notes, Thiessen has written a book that covers different books of the Bible. And it's a summary type study, something like what you've had this 13 weeks on John. And... Uh, he mentions one or two things that I hadn't really thought about, but if you started it in John 1 to the end of chapter 21 and noted what John covered on Christ's life, it would add up to 20 days because he really didn't. And much of what he recorded in regard to Jesus' life, occurs from chapter 13 to 21. That's over a third of the book, and that's over about a week. And uh, so, in regard to all the details, like Donnie mentioned, in regard to their living a few miles apart, and how much interchange had they had with each other, I don't know. I just know that in John 1, 29, when he saw the Spirit descending as a dove and he didn't say, I think now this may be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That wasn't the way he said it. He said, this is the Lamb of God. So at that point, Billy, he knew by inspiration, any other acquaintance factors that had come along is speculation. But a good question. Any other question that someone wishes to ask? And there's the general silence that often happens in an adult class. When I was in Nigeria working, uh, we'd preach about 15, 20 minutes and we'd have questions for two hours. <laughs> They were loaded with questions, and many of them were quite good questions. I wasn't, they weren't talking about something out in the bush in Nigeria. Uh, many of them had valid questions, had heard so many different missionaries come through with different doctrines, and it left them with all kinds of questions. 
another opportunity for questions, or we're going to the outline. Yes, Art. Did you make a comment on? I wasn't seeing it in here, but in John chapter one, it either indicates very strongly or just blatantly makes a statement to the fact that Jesus was God. And there are some religious groups, some who even say that they are Christians, um, who, who basically say it's not there. That Jesus is not God like the Father is God, and uh, they make a difference and discrepancy between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Usually that confusion has come because of Colossians, the first chapter, which points out that Jesus was the firstborn and uh, so they say that Jesus was somehow born of Jehovah God, and uh, that made him a lesser rank. Doesn't make good sense on the basis of all the Bible teaching. And the Greek term that's used there in regard to the forerunner or the first simply means that he was the beginning of that particular facet of what God had people to do. Turn to Philippians, the second chapter. Wait, I, did I say Philippians? I meant Colossians. The second chapter. Start in verse 8. Take heed lest there shall be anyone that make a spoil of you through his philosophy and vain deceit. That indicates you better watch out at this point. There are going to be people come along and they're going to philosophize and they're going to try to deceive people. About what? Read on. After the tradition of men, that shows you the foundation of their philosophizing and guessing. After the rudiments of the world, and not after God. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in him you are made full. There's a term all and there's a term fullness to emphasize that. And in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Another interesting term. Uh, in the book I wrote on restoration revival in the seven ones in Ephesians 1, it says in part in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and I believe it's five or six, there is one God, but notice, don't stop there, there's a coordinating conjunction, and, and Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. You know, there's the power of God, He's over all, through all, there's His providence, and in all, there's His presence of God. But that's God whom? The Father. In that same list of ones, there is one Lord. Well, Philippians 2, or Colossians 2, identifies Jesus as a part of the Godhead. And in, how, in the book, I've got an entire section on the Trinity that relates to varied expressions that shows that the Spirit, Jesus, God... Jehovah, the Father, all had traits of divinity. So these three make up the Godhead. Then how is Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 one God cover? He is the only one who's the Father. And why is He the Father? Because in their combined intent for the needs of people on the earth, there would be one who would be born of Mary who would become what? 
the Son, Son of Man and Son of God. And in that plan, he for a time took on humanity, but Colossians 2 makes it very clear that in him dwelled all the fullness, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's about as clear as you can state it. So earlier in Colossians, where it's talking that about him being the four pattern of some of that plan, that's right. He was the first one to come as a savior for fallen man. And then God gave to him all the preeminence, Colossians 1.18, and he's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. But uh, as to John 1, let's come to a portion of your outline since we're dealing with that. Come over to, yeah, page 4. Sometimes I put out outlines, don't even give the number, but there is page four. To that section on the witnesses that we were talking about a moment ago. The first witness is, of course, the forerunner, John the baptizer. And then there's the witness of the father. There's a witness of the scripture, the witness of the son, the witness of the spirit, the witness of his works, and the witness of his workers or disciples, including John. Count them up. There are seven witnesses and what is their witness? If we take time, and I'm going to probably pause and read some of these verses to just assure you what I'm saying is in there all the way. All seven of those are emphasizing one of two things. Jesus is easily referred to as God, like in John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That says it. And so he, John, became a witness of the fact he is God. But all seven of these witness that Jesus is either God or Son of God. That's what the seven witnesses are. That's in your outline. So if you want to just get reduplicated proof in regard to Jesus being God or Son of God, there's an entire list of verses and we can spend the rest of our hour just covering that section. I won't do all of them, but let's do uh, one of them. Turn down to that uh, fourth section, the witness of the Son. What did Jesus say about himself? He ought to have known a little bit about who he was. You see, the witness of the Son, number 4, John 5, 17 and 18. We'll just take time to do a little Bible reading here. 5, 17 and 18. But Jesus answered them, my Father worketh even until now, and I work. I'm sure glad they do. For this cause, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. Why? Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own Father, making himself, what? Equal with God. There is one time 
Get the next one, 8 and 14. Jesus will verify again. Jesus answered and said unto them, Even if I bear witness of myself, there's the witness, my witness is true. For I know whence I came and whether I go, but you know not whether I came or whether I go. But he is his own witness in that case. Look in 10, 24 through 30. That's in regard to him being the shepherd. Ten twenty four. The Jews therefore came around about him and said unto him, How long do you hold us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name these bear witness of me, for you believe not because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they know me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who's given them unto me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Speaking of his security, but identifying himself there very plainly as God the Father, so he's the Son. Very clearly identified. Look in 19, or 1837. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered him, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end have I been born, and to this end am I come into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. There is repeated statements on his part. And if you look at the other passages, every one of these seven witnesses would be witnessing one of two things, either calling him God or Son of God. And I think of this business we've had recently in our courts of the opiate drug impact that's hit our area and affected a lot of people and damaged them and now they're trying to find out who's guilty. Have you noticed how many times on TV they've said a witness, a witness, a witness for this side and that side? I guarantee you, you won't have this much evidence right here at those courtrooms to decide those things as you have the fact that Jesus is either God or Son of God. Seven different witnesses as to who he is. If there's further question on that, uh, and you want to take more time, we could spend the rest of our time reading all of those other verses. But they're there for you, and you'll find that what I've mentioned is true. There's just reduplicated proof that he is God Son of God, equal with God, called God. And only reason he's son, because he was born of Mary for us. And that's divinity reaching down to lift up humanity. Any other question? Come then to the first of this outline, and I'm going to just highlight what you have in your hand, 
And that may raise some questions also, if it does, or we can deal with them. You'll notice part one on page one, we're dealing with the writer. I doubt if there is any one of the 27 books that so strongly verifies who the writer is as this group of thoughts verifies that John was the writer of this gospel. And uh, you can look down through those. A Palestinian Jew, because of his vivid acquaintance with the topography, temple, and things in the area of Palestine, Jerusalem in particular, look at how many verses you have there in part B. All of those indicate he was quite well acquainted with the territory where Jesus walked. And then an eyewitness because of his exactness in stating even the hour when certain things occurred. He knew the hour of the day. Of course, the Holy Spirit could have guided him, but it indicates he was there. Notice the next sentence. Even more convincing is John 19, 34 and 35, where the writer affirms that he had seen the blood and the water that came from Jesus' side. Now, if you doubt that that's in there, let's just turn to that one. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because I don't think you're concerned about his being the writer. And I know I'm not. And uh, I don't want to take up our time dealing with something that's not really that pertinent to what you may need today or tomorrow. But John 19, 34 and 35, John just very plainly stated that that disciple that wrote this saw that. 19, 34, and 35. But when they came to Jesus and saw that He was dead already, they broke not His legs, howbeit one of the soldiers with a spear pierced His side, and straightway there came out blood and water. And he that hath seen has borne witness, and his witness is true. The one that wrote this was there. And uh, the, if you look at all of these ABCs and on down through this page, you've got just reduplicated proof. He knew how the apostles felt and reacted, number one under D. Which of the twelve of the twelve you could run through them? And he mentions all the others. And then he keeps mentioning that disciple that Jesus loved which is obviously the writer, if you read all of those. And the one that's missed, there were about two that were not mentioned, and one of them was John, and the other one was hardly mentioned anywhere in any account except maybe listing the apostles in some other places. So the logical conclusion is the one that was writing these things would have been John. And uh, there's, over on the next page, you've got external tradition. External tradition doesn't prove anything. It just indicates that what Scripture's already proven is true. It verifies it. Then John is seen in Scripture. John, the son of Zebedee and Salome and so forth. Down at the bottom of that, you've got the date and place of writing. If you were interested in that. Uh, this type of information never has appealed to me. When I went to Butler and took a course up there in New Testament survey of the books, we spent so much time on things like this as to where it was written, when it was written. I don't care where it was written or when it was. I, I don't know of any biblical truth that proves. It takes up a lot of time. But if you want it, there's some information in that regard. It's pretty evident it was written about 90 A.D. at Ephesus. And uh, if you want to look at that material, it's there for you to see. Then on the next page, page 3, part 3, the purpose of this gospel. Marty mentioned it right at the outset when he began his weeks of study on the book. But we've got two things here primarily affirmed in the 21 chapters of John, to declare the Lord's 
incarnation, the unity of both divinity and humanity, or the human nature in Christ. He became flesh, that one that was in the beginning. The Word was with us. The Word was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory and all down through verse 14 and 15 identifying that he became flesh. That's one thing that's emphasized. Now, if you want to know why we say the flesh part is, drop down to the bottom of the next paragraph. And in the account by John of Jesus' life, he's the one that mentions that Jesus was thirsty, said Jesus was weary, Knowing human anguish, human joy, and there's a whole string of verses if we wanted to look them up where he gives a very personal human insight to what Jesus faced. But the other passages we were looking at in regard to the witness a moment ago, that's the fact he's son of God too, as well as son of man. But uh, there's that information if you would be interested in that part of the purpose. The second purpose is the one that Marty has been emphasizing over these weeks, to make believers in Jesus Christ as God's Son, that through Him, the thee ought to be they. You may want to put a Y on that. They might have life. And Marty has emphasized John 20 and 31 several times. And that is the emphasis that he was giving by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. You may have life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, have it abundantly. That is the purpose of the 21 chapters. Make believers. I want to take just a moment here and uh, give a good thought that you may already have, but that we need to have. I've forgotten exactly where it is in here, which page. Uh, on page... Uh, Well, where is the page number on that page? Then it be page six. Oh, yeah, there it is, page six. Go over to that, and uh, I'll just point out what I'm about to mention. You see Roman numeral six characteristics on right at the top of page six. The word believe is a key word in the gospel, occurring 98 times. Now, down if you read on down through the next section and all the words that are mentioned so many times down there, it mentions that uh, Ralph Arroy Lauren in his book said it's mentioned 99. Anyhow, 98 or 99 times the word belief is in those 21 chapters. What I want to do is give you the definition of the term itself. And you might need this in some personal contact because there's a host of people all around us that do believe that Jesus is the Savior. The problem is, how do you get into Him, become one of His? And there's where we have different ideas and people are teaching different doctrines. And uh, if I could simplify this, you could put a long straight line like that and studying with someone all the way across the page and just put belief on there. And probably most of the people you will study with would go along with believing. You know what the real question is? When in the process of believing do we become children of God? Now that's a battleground. Cause many debates. 
And I want you to see that the basic answer is in the Greek term as given in any Greek lexicon of the Koine Greek or New Testament. Here is the word believe. Pistuo is defined like this. To think to be true. To be persuaded of. That's belief. Place confidence in. Used especially of the faith by which a man embraces Jesus. And probably the people with whom you study would embrace him as Jesus and the Son of God and our Savior. They just said you're saved at this time and we'd say no, you're not saved till this time. There's the difference. Now listen to the rest of the definition. And I might mention this is from Thayer's lexicon and he was not a member of the church. But he knew what scriptures taught and he tried to define terms by that. Now listen to the rest of the definition of what is Bible belief. A conviction full of joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. And probably anyone you study with would agree with that part. Here's where they, as some say, jump off the bridge. Conjoined with obedience in Christ. It's only when that faith will obey that salvation can be given. They might say, well, I'm obeying. Ask them for the purpose of baptism itself. And they will squirm and do everything they can to try to not accept the fact that it's tied in with remission of sins or to be saved or to get into Christ, the real purposes of baptism. So you see, we all agree that we're saved by belief. It's when in the process of that believing do we get into Christ? Do we receive remission of sins? Do we come into a relationship with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit? Every one of them is at baptism. And if you get off on that, you get off from what scriptures teach of the way to get into Christ. And you've got things going on just like in John where... People believe a little bit and then try to quit. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, even of the rulers, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And then God has an insight as to what was the motive behind their decision. For they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. And it's so sad that this particular point is pulled out of its purpose by a mass of people that claim to follow Christ and they're missing getting into him in the process. The devil's very subtle. He doesn't care when you get off just so you get off. I remember Brother Marshall Keeble talking about even among brethren. He said, I'll tell you, we got some brethren that get right down the road. They're doing beautifully, and they're living happily. But then there's some get off on the right. And he said, or on the left. And he said, these over here get upset about it, and they stand up so straight they fall off the bridge backwards. He said, either way, you're off the bridge. 
Well, that's kind of how the devil likes to do it. Just get us off somewhere, and we miss what needs to be done. You've got the seven miracles listed there, and then you'll notice over on the next page the seven I am's. And I might mention, I think I've heard the first bell already, that this, these seven I am's are quite unique. God knows us. He knows people. And there's something here to appeal to all kind of human background thinkers and mindsets. The bread of life will appeal, and it did in that day, didn't it? Didn't some of them follow him then when they saw him making out of five loaves and two fishes a meal for thousands? Hook on to that. That's better than red lobster. And uh, thus, that's what some want. Well, if they'll just hold on to Jesus with a carnal thought like that, did he say, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and what? These things will be added to you. Can he take care of people that like bread? Marty talks about food all the time. He ought to like this about Jesus being the bread of life. But there are others that are just going around in a daze and stumping their toe and falling down and getting disgusted with life in general because they keep flubbing up there and flubbing up there. He is the light of the world. Seeing better now? If you want to see the best, look through the lens of Jesus Christ. You see how he's each one of these things that will appeal to the needs of different people? I think of Fanny Crosby wrote so many of the songs in the songbook. Blind. She had great faith. And she liked the portion that says we walk by faith and not by sight. And Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Trust in him. I'm the door. I'd like to be sure you get in the right party. Well, he's the right party. Straight and narrow way. Well, there's that second bell. I've got to stop. And look at that good shepherd. And you got there, the shepherd takes care of dumb sheep. <laughs> And some of us are just kind of wandering around lost. And he can put us in the fold. Take care of us. Yes? I've got a little side note on sheep and all that. I had two distilleries in Louisiana. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. And I had a little bit of sheep and all that. One of the least protected animals on this earth are, are sheep. And uh, isn't it good that we sheep can have a shepherd? Uh, but uh, then what about resurrection and life? The deaths we've had here, Ruth and I and some of our prayers recently, I think there are 11 people among your, the Lord's church that have passed away here over the past few months. Right here. With it, not this congregation and east side. And uh, happy that he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and whosoever. No man can come unto me except the Father that sent me draw him. But I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Ah, he's, he's dandy. He can fit any of the needs we have. True vine. Production. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Verse 8. Oh, we could go on a little while, but we've got to quit. 
Got to follow the bells of our day. But I hope this has helped you some, and this outline has got a lot in it that we hadn't covered tonight. You know that. Do a little study on your own. And if you have any questions when you're studying some of it, give me a call. We'll talk about it. You are dismissed.